have focuses in the areas of health technologies, maternal health, child health, reproductive health, vaccines and immunization, and emerging and epidemic diseases such as HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. Uh, in 2014 alone, PATH helped 160 million people. Uh, before that, uh, Steve was also CEO of digital media firm Corvus. He was the director of social innovation for McKinsey, and he was the CEO of the Infectious Disease Research Institute. Uh, Steve is also has practiced law and international um, international law and intellectual property, and he earned his BA from Princeton, his MA uh, in Chinese studies from the University of Washington, and his law degree from Columbia. So. Please help me welcome Steve Davis. Hi. Well, first of all, um, it's great to be here um, at Stanford. I actually uh, teach at the Graduate School of Business in the Social Innovation Program. I'm a lecturer, so I, um, I'm in familiar territory. I actually taught across the hall, but um, it's, it's always great to be uh, here on campus and, uh, and with you all. So. Um, kind of got the marching orders that this is a, you know, a, a, a lecture or a time to talk about uh, entrepreneurship and social innovation and a little bit about how I see it, a little bit of what I do, a little bit what PATH does, and that mainly a conversation. So I'm going to try to be brief and mainly uh, want to spend time hearing and listening and talking to what you guys are thinking as well. Um, but let me uh, talk, I'll first talk a little bit about myself, which I hate to actually do, and, but that, that was part of what I was asked to do. I want to talk a little bit more about social innovation and global health, and that's what I work on sort of obsessively, and I think there's a huge amount of room for social entrepreneurs in that space. And then talk um, a little bit about some of the themes I see in the social innovation space that might be relevant. So um, I... Uh, um, won't go through my background or my bio, but a lot of people, including my mother, my 90-year-old mother still asks me what I'm going to do when I grow up or if I've decided, and the answer is I don't know. And my major message is you don't need to know. Um, and and uh, I think that um, knowing what you want to do is way overrated. So um, the next time you're stressing out about your job or your summer or your resume, just rem I hope you will remember this speech and said, well, I guess that guy I did okay, and he didn't ever know what he wanted to do either. Um, so, uh, and the example would be, I'm um, getting, okay, um, so I don't, okay, yeah, I can manage that. The, so, so I've done a lot of different things uh, in my life, uh, and I went to law school, I specialized in Chinese law, I've done a lot of community activism, I've started a number of nonprofit organizations over the years. I've also sat on the boards of a number of, of organizations. I also um, helped start a for-profit or two and have been involved uh, as a lawyer. I directed the social innovation program globally for McKinsey. I helped start a digital media company in the early days, so I did a number of things in, um, uh, in uh, early days. Bill Gates and I worked together to start Corbis, which is a digital media organization. And um, now I'm running one of the largest NGOs in the world working in global health. So rather than make sense of all those different things and teaching at Stanford and all the rest, I, I think of it as having a few arcs in my life. And maybe that's a better way to describe it for the conversation today, which is more about you know, how do people engage in social entrepreneurism and social innovation? How do you keep engaged? Uh, how do you, um, you know, what are the things that motivate you to do that? So I've actually, think I've been pretty lucky to have been part of what I think are emerging to be four big themes or arcs in my life as I've, very, as I've jumped around a lot. Um, one is I um, uh, grew up in a little town of Montana, uh, and, and I was uh, uh, on a farm. I was a, a you know, cow country guy and went to rodeos and watched football. But I also, um, way back in the 70s, uh, and, and knew that I was gay. And so I actually have read the sort of arc as a gay man from the 70s in a very sort of repressed environment in Montana through um, activism in the 80s and protesting uh, with, uh, on HIV and AIDS to working in uh, gay rights issues, being on uh, the, the National Board of Lambda Legal Defense Fund um, to early on start talking about things like gay marriage and rights to serve in the military. And, 
And now, you know, 30 some 40 years later, look back and have a partner of 30 some years, a, a child who's 20 and in college like you guys. And, uh, you know, we live in a world which has changed a lot. And there's still a lot of work we have to do to be part of that, um, that story. It, there's huge amounts of uh, discrimination based on gender and sexual orientation around the world and for, even in our country. But, um, but it's been a pretty amazing ride on that front uh, to be part and to, uh, you know, uh, have been a, an active part of that and still, in fact, have still engaged on issues related to um, uh, uh, gender rights and sexual orientation. In fact, um, sometimes uh, this year in Davos at the World Economic Forum participated in really one of the first ever conversations in that setting about the global gay and lesbian agenda. So that's been an important place where I've actually learned a lot. Uh, it's inspired me. It's troubled me. But I also have done a lot of entrepreneurship. So helping organize uh, groups, uh, putting together, NGO I've served on NGOs, but also starting them based on the passion of, of needing to solve work on civil rights. And, and that's, a, that's a long story. The second arc was really a parallel arc in my life, which was I, um, when I was uh, graduating from Princeton, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a religion major and studied politics and didn't want to do either and went off to Asia um, on a fellowship and uh, learned and was plunked down without any ability to speak the language and, and learn Chinese. And I, um, I, I became a Chinese kind of expert after a while. I had went and got a couple extra degrees and. Chinese politics, my law degree is actually in Chinese law, um, and, uh, and I fell in love with China and all things Chinese um, and, and, um, and have been involved in China my entire life, including, you know, I will be there next month. Uh, uh, we are, we're working closely with the Chinese government, and I work closely on how to keep, get China more engaged in global health and development issues globally. And um, so China has been a really interesting ride for me, and that's the other, another part of the arc. So I've seen China when I went over there riding bicycles. We weren't even, uh, initially I was in Taiwan and then was in Beijing, but, and then was at Beijing University, but you know, where I would, you know, we'd have to sneak over the, the fence to go get peanuts from the, you know, the vendor in order to, because I was eating, you know, cabbage with the North Koreans in the dorm and we weren't, you know, there's no protein in our diet and, you know, and it was just this crazy time back in the early 80s living in China to now I go and, you know, it's how many ring roads and it's the most, one of the most vibrant places in the world. So it's been a really incredible um, opportunity to be part of that um, changing history. Um, and I was quite involved in a number of things from helping organize. Um, uh, I was part of the early work on the democracy side. I published one of the first papers on the uh, death penalty in China. Um, and uh, on, the, on, the, on those kinds of issues. But then when I built my company, we actually opened up an office in China, so got to understand that. I sit on a couple of boards with uh, large Chinese operations. So um, see China from both the commercial angle but also the development angle. The third arc um, was my very, very fo big fortune to have one day in, in, as a young lawyer um, uh, tripped over uh, not a, a conversation where Bill Gates Sr. Um, was a lawyer in the firm I was in, and he was promoting the United Way, which I was not a big fan of. And I criticized it very politely, but I suggested that maybe we should rethink that the establishment model and blah, blah, blah. And, the next day he walks into my office and he's like, I'm thinking, oh my God, what a career limiting mood that was. I, you know, even though I thought I was being nice, I, you know, m all my friends were like, do you know, like the Gates family and like the, the United Way. And, and it turns out that, um, that um, he challenged me to kind of put my time where my mouth was. And if I thought that, you know, that the United Way wasn't working, then would I volunteer, you know, that kind of volunteer, but to, to um, help redesigned the United Way, which I did, and then became the board chair in, in Northwest and at 33 or something, and, and um, became on the national stage on the United Way. But the more important piece of that story was I got involved with the Gates family, and I ended up then um, at one point um, leaving the firm to go work with Bill's son, uh, uh, Bill Gates of Microsoft fame uh, and now foundation fame, to, um, to um, go help start a digital media idea that he and I had, he had and I took 
forward. Um, so I got involved in the internet really early. Um, I was, we were, uh, I helped actually Bill edit his first book where it was on, um, and we talked about the um, super information highway. I mean, we didn't even use the word internet. And, um, and you know, started thinking about what you could do with digital, but we were talking about two-way packets of media um, that we could move around in this new world. And, and now, of course, that's been quite a ride for all of us, and certainly here in Silicon Valley, um, to see how um, that's played out over the last 25 years. And, and um, I was part of that early story. We built a company. We've, it, I left it in 2005, but it went global. And, and it was a really great ride. I mean, it was, you know, we made all sorts of mistakes, and it went up and down and in and out, but we built, you know, we had to learn all these things about copyright and, you know, new pricing and what this new media form and alliances and censorship and all the rest. So it was quite a ride. So I've, I've been very lucky to have been part of those three arcs, and I, those continue. I'm engaged in all three still. Um, but um, the probably uh, what's interesting is over the last 10 years of my life, there's been kind of a pivot and shaping around um, being part of what I really now see is really where it all comes together around social innovation and social innovation for purposes of global development. And that's where I've really put a lot of my energy um, now uh, running a large NGO. I'll tell you a little bit about but more, um, it's what I teach here at Stanford. I teach in the advanced uh, how to scale or uh, social innovation. Um, and, and it's where I led the practice at McKinsey. But it was also really bringing together business, bringing together you know, innovation and digital and life science innovation, and, but focusing on what we can do to help support people um, in, to, in their, to realize their full potential in places that have less resources or where there's extraordinary structural inequity or there are market failures of, of complete, complete market failures. And so, um, and, and that's the most interesting arc because uh, we have this extraordinary potential in this, in our lifetime to really make a huge difference. And we see the more, you'll see some numbers, the mortality, morbidity rates of children and, you, uh, and, and mothers going down dramatically around the world, the uh, opportunities for more, um, more equity, more, more um, opportunity, despite all the, all the challenges we have is, is really quite extraordinary. So um, I, I really want to then spend a little more time on this fourth arc and happy to talk about any one of the others. Um, Going forward, so let me, you know, I won't read, I don't like reading slides, but and I can tell um, let me just tell you a little bit about who PATH is, because it's likely the largest NGO in the world you've never heard of, which is um, um, a problem, our problem, uh, that I inherited a few years ago, that we are um, uh, kind of a group that does a lot of great work around the world, but we've never spent much money on marketing or promoting ourselves. I'm trying to change that, but we're not an insignificant size um, organization as it relates to um, headcount and breadth um, uh, and, and, and money in the NGO sector. Um, but the really important thing is that we're really all about innovation, and we really lead the global health innovation work globally, and, and, but through multi-sector approaches. And you can see some of the, the sort of the scale that we reach. So billions of units of some of the products we develop, um, hundreds of millions of beneficiaries, uh, kind of unusual numbers for an NGO. So um, we, we do five, we kind of think about advancing innovation we, we, across five core things. And I'll tell you just a slight bit about each, but I can go forever, so I won't. But you know, vaccines, drugs, um, diagnostics, devices, and system and service innovation. And, and what we do is we're not, um, we're not a scientist, a lot of uh, my teams are scientists or PhDs or, um, you know, public health specialists, but we, we actually don't have a lot of lab scientists. We actually work with academic and industry labs who uh, are people that come up with great ideas, but they don't know how to get that great idea to scale, and how do we actually get it into the hands of people that need it the most. So we're actually in this very sort of, I like to say, we focus on this unsexy middle of the value chain, which um, if any of you have taken classes on development or on product development or design, you'll know what that means, but it's this, this place that you have to take 
take a great idea, whether it's a new technology or a new system or a new service, and how do you take it so it gets to scale and advances so people use it and where it's meaningful and has impact? And it's that middle area that's very complicated. And, and I would say, and I would actually be, I would say quite you know, directly, here at Stanford in Silicon Valley, there is a huge, re, a huge love for the first step. The, you know, the design, the, the programs around design, the programs around, you know, new ideas, startup garage, all of that great stuff, which I think is fantastic on the social entrepreneurship side. There's actually somewhat of a little bit of a romance with the last mile stuff. People go off and, you know, experience a, a something somewhere in the world, but there's very little attention to paid to that really, really tough spot in between the last mile and the garage. And, and so I think it's an area that we need to all be spending more time with, and that's what I would try to teach here. This is why we do it, and you know, sort of is that, as I mentioned, we've actually been making enormous progress. And so one of the things that I find sometimes coming to school is, is that people are so, you know, rightfully depressed by what we see in the world around us. And there's a lot of reasons to get depressed. I mean, whether it's, um, you know, the amount of inequity that is growing in the world and the, you know, crises of the moment and their huge human crises, whether it's Syria or Zika or, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 refugees. But, um, but despite that, and I don't mean to ignore that, but despite that, we are actually, as, a hum as humanity, we're making enormous progress in terms of broad human development. More people have been pulled out of utter poverty. We're seeing the sort of classic pyramid move into a different form where we don't have as many people at the base of the pyramid. And, and we're actually seeing a huge reduction in deaths of, of women and children in the last 40 years. But our goal is to accelerate the target. And this is what we spend an obsessive amount of time, is what can we do at the global health community and leading on the innovation side to bend those curves? And even, because this is a huge number of lives that we can help save if we bend those curves. So we do that, um, and we think about, um, you know, let me just give you a couple examples. I won't spend enough time to go through each group. But let me give you an example of in a vaccine area. So there's many children every year die of vaccine preventable deaths. Um, and it's, it's really quite horrific if you think about it, that we know how to prevent many things. But kids, if they're unfortunate to live in a certain part of the world or in a certain uh, so socioeconomic class or in a certain caste, they are not given, they're not access to those diseases, uh, d those vaccines. And this is, the vaccines are magical. They, you know, for a very low cost per unit, they can prevent a lifetime of suffering. And most people in the developed and rich world have access to those that we have. Now there are diseases for which we do not have a vaccine yet. And so those are tough diseases like HIV, where we have people working for it, and pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies are working on those solutions. But there are also a number of diseases for which the, um, the, there's not much market incentive because they are mainly diseases of the poor and there's no investment model that would ever show that you could put enough money in to get a return on that. Um, and so what we do is we focus on those. Because we're an NGO, we actually um, are focused on addressing that inequity in the system. So we get philanthropic support, we get commercial deals, we do a lot of complex IP work in order to create a mechanism to incent uh, industry to participate in getting these things solved. So here's an example, and it's one of 20 things we're working on. So we recognized about 15 years ago that meningitis, a horrible neurological disease, which you know, you probably know of meningitis here, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a belt against which we, um, literally thousands of kids would die every year, but actually more, and, and as tragically, um, hundreds of thousands of kids would get, suffer neurological damage and often be disabled for life um, after this. And, and it became the most dreaded disease, and there were studies shown that it was sort of the cycle through, from sort of the, uh, um, East, West Africa from, say, Senegal all the way over to Sudan or Somalia. This was this belt where this would happen. And, and yet, and so the African leadership of the group said, you know, this is not okay that you guys have an, an epidemic meningitis vaccine in most places in the world, 
how come we can't get one for this part of the world and it's a particular strain? So there was a partnership that was committed. PATH was at the center of the partnership, but we actually started pulling together a variety of players from the FDA had to get involved for regulatory purposes. There was underlying patented science that we needed to use. We actually got the Serum Institute in Pune, India to engage on low-cost manufacturing and pull together a model. And what was very important is to focus on the strain in Africa where so many kids were dying. But um, what was very important is the African, is having African health ministers at the table, at the design table, who said, you know, this has to be done less than 50 cents a dose. And so just, I've sat on vaccine company boards, so I can tell you most vaccines and drugs are not made with a cost as part of your product profile. Most of the time what you do when you develop a drug or a vaccine is you spend a lot of really important time and money, billions sometimes, doing R&D and then you figure out the right answer through very expensive clinical trials and then you add some sort of profit margin and you, you, you know, divide by, the, this is oversimplistic, divide by the, the number of potential doses and that's your cost per dose, right? That's how you come up with the cost for a pill or a drug and then people mess around with it. Um, we took the opposite, and we do that repeatedly. We say we've got to start the scientific journey with cost in mind, because if we're going to make this accessible to the poorest people in the world, then we need to be able to have it affordable by the public markets that can get it to those kids. So we did that in this case, and we were very successful. We've got a, de a you know, very complex, you don't want to go, this is a great case study and why we made decisions when we did, and the business model and the partnership model. But fundamentally got to an approval, and I was in um, Addis uh, Ababa in, in February where we were celebrating its, um, its, its really unqualified success. Now we've seen a new vaccine. Uh, it's at 50 cents a dose. It's um, been rolled out to over a quarter billion people, of about 240 million to date. None of those people have had a case of meningitis. Um, and uh, we virtually eliminated meningitis A in Africa because of this effort. And um, now we're working on the other strains of meningitis. We are already working on a pentavalent vaccine. And we think that we could potentially eliminate um, uh, meningitis uh, in Africa um, with this process. So this is about as good as it gets in terms of scaled, multi-sector social impact and really, and plus creating a sustainable business model. So actually the Serum Institute of India now has motivation to continue to manufacture this um, and WHO and UNICEF distribute it in these countries. Um, and then this is the results, and you can see the number of cases that we think will be diverted and some of the, um, the, the legacy that we've created. So we're doing this. We've recently, working with GSK, have just done the first ever malaria vaccine. Um, and we are working on a number of other vaccines. We similarly do that with drugs um, um, and uh, diagnostics. I can't go through all of those. But let me tell you a little bit about sort of the other side of the innovation curve, which is um, not a big, expensive, multi-hundred million dollar vaccine development effort, but the simple, what we sometimes talk about, frugal tools and technology. And this is an example of how do we develop, adapt, and use simpler tools. Um, so um, we recognize in the social innovation and how to get things to scale, some of it is we need to shift the tasks. We call it task shifting. I, I, I spend some time in my class on this, which is, to enable things to get to more people, sometimes you need to have less qualified people being able to use it. So what does that mean? Unpack that. It means that do we need an, a qualified nurse to be able to fill a syringe to keep the bubble out? That's, not a, that's a fairly technical thing to learn how to do. And then there's qual So could we create some way so I can give somebody a vaccine without being a qualified nurse? Um, or a medical assistance. And we came up with this idea of, well, if you put it in a little pre-filled package, this is, you can see the size, um, and all you have to do is boop and squeeze, then you've avoided, you've enabled that to be a, ta we've task shifted, we've enabled someone else to deliver a vaccine who doesn't have to be so well trained. And so we've done this with this device, it's being used, it's being very, it's called the Uniject device. But then we started thinking about another problem which is there are a number of women, particular, uh, in, well, women in Africa, particularly who um, are not, who are asking for modern family planning methods. So we estimate there's about a quarter 
um, million uh, women in the world, a um, quarter billion women in the world, who actually are asking for contraception but don't have access. And most often it's there's supply issues, but often there's you know family, uh, partner dynamics, community dynamics that make that less accessible. So we thought, what if, um, and particularly in places, and again, this is focused on Sub-Saharan Africa, where um, where often there's uh, the dynamic is where women aren't allowed to go and to a clinic and get to a tool. Um, and so we said, what if we took, worked with, you know, Pfizer that has a long-lasting injectable contraceptive called Deprovera, and actually put it into this Uniject device and then got it to the right price and got communities uh, to distribute this that women could actually self-inject. Them, uh, so they don't have to go to the clinic or get permission from their husbands or partners to go. And, and could this help you know, solve a problem that we've had, which is how to get access? So we've actually done this. Um, uh, we've introduced it in a number of countries. It's already available uh, for self-injection in the UK. We're actually doing the operational research now to say, I mean, there's really high demand for this. In fact, if we could do it, we'd do it tomorrow. But I've been actually being more cautious to say we need to understand the unintended consequences. We, under, we need to study this a little bit more to understand what the, the, the issues are. But this is actually a, a big game changer. For the first time, we see about 90,000 women have access to modern family planning to, for the first time. And, and this is a, 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 big, a big opportunity. So this is the idea of taking simple tools, rethinking the way we introduce them, and thinking it for um, other communities. And then, of course, we don't just focus on products and technologies, but as important is how do we change the systems in which they're being um, delivered. So this is really the realm of process innovation and system innovation. And we have lots of um, examples around the world. This is actually our biggest portfolio. But this is just my last example, um, is uh, um, multi-drug resistance tuberculosis. It's this, the really scary kind. that You get it, you can't get rid of it. It's very deadly, very virulent. And um, it's very prevalent in the very poor slums of Mumbai, where you have enormous amounts of it. You've got very con highly congested communities, very poor communities. But we were asked to look at how this works. And of course, the assumption was this is a government problem, right? These are super poor slums. The government has a problem. And the reality is, if you start investigating it, it turns out that it's about 60% of the people in, that, uh, in those uh, wards, and there's across about 3 million people in these specifically very poor wards, um, are getting their frontline health through private sector providers, one person stores like that picture where a single doctor, maybe not, maybe not a real doctor, but has some level of some training um, are, are set up to provide that kind of service. And so we started looking at that. But the problem is, is if somebody came in for their TB services from this guy, and the guy goes and calls the government and says, I, I'm treating somebody for MDR-TB, the government would take away the guy's patient. So no, they have to come down. So the problem was not about not having the right tool or medicine. It was the system was designed with the, the sort of bad incentives. It wasn't, there, the incentives weren't aligned. So we sat down with the government at their request, and this is all our sort of a big team of Indian doctors and others, said, so how do we realign the incentives here that we can actually um, create a more uh, set of training and tools to enable you, the government, to actually save money by, by enabling them to do the right thing by treating, and you want to encourage the private sector providers, but you want to encourage them with the right training. But you still need to pay them, but pay them efficiently, so let's put a digital voucher system in so these mini micropayments could be rewarded easily. So we did that, and we've actually, I just saw some numbers on my, on my, um, my phone that we've seen record levels of both um, adherence and compliance. So this is a new people getting treated, adherence to the regime, which is really important when you're taking these drugs. We now actually are going to be doing this with HIV drugs and other drugs to, to, to work on um, aligning incentives. So this is sometimes it's not only the the tool or the product, but it's actually you know the system they're working in, and can we use innovation and smart thinking around that? 
it really is an amazing time in global health. I won't, we've done some real work on as the, we've committed as a global community to the sustainable development goals, um, what it, it will take to actually reach the targets in 2030 in health. And we think that there's a, a set of key innovations that we already know what they look like if we can get them to scale. And it's product innovation, system innovation, and service innovation. And I think we're quite confident, I'm very confident and excited, and this is, gets back to the sort of the fourth arc um, to be part of, that we can do this in the next 15 years. And I, I, I'm very confident for really four reasons, or really sort of at the base of, of my optimism. One is we have momentum on our side. And, um, and momentum is not just that it incre increases sort of the speed and the opportunity, but actually with health at least, healthier people then will have, it, there's a virtuous cycle. If you're uh, slight, healthier, you're gonna actually take care of yourself and your family and then that actually has its own cascading effect. So, so we've got a lot of great momentum. We also have political will that we've really unparalleled. Amount of investment into global health and development, a lot of commitment, a lot of uh, you know, millennials putting, doing social entrepreneurial work, impact investing, but we also now have, as you know, the global goals or the sustainable development goals, which are the 193 member states of the United Nations unanimously committed to an, a series of commitments, including uh, on, on health and climate and other things. So this is, gives us a framework in which we, I think we can do even more. We also, as I mentioned, have seen this enormous shift in global demographics, um, which we talked for years about the base, the pyramid, and the base of the pyramid. But actually, if you do the numbers, the pyramid is starting to reshape itself into kind of a funny diamond. And, and that diamond has a lot of implications. So first of all, um, you know, we'll still see extreme poverty and wealth inequity, so that's not changing. But the big shift is more and more people that were sort of traditionally chronically poor at the bottom of the pyramid are now part of a lower middle income um, and, uh, set of, uh, of consumers. And so now there's this incentive for more corporate community and entrepreneurial, I mean, um, corporate and entrepreneurial engagement in that lower income marketplace, and we see that. We also see uh, a shift where the poorest people in the world are no longer um, living only in the poorest countries in the world. In fact, the poorest people in the world are actually living in middle income countries often. So now we've got to shift our thinking as humans how to help people in low income communities, not poor countries. And that's a different shift. And so it means the way we think about this has to change. But it's all quite positive, but it does require some really major mental model shifts in how we go about doing our work. And finally, there's nothing you know, that I can't tell this audience about uh, that is about disruptive technologies. We are, in fact, in a, in a real disruptive time technologically. So, you know, uh, I was just over this morning at Facebook and how we're going to use social media to mobilize communities differently around pandemics, how we are using um, digital tools to do diagnose, diagnose things remotely. How, I mean, we, we have so much opportunity to pull the sort of digital tools into our whole panoply of solutions. Um, and also we have now, of course, on the life sciences side, the genetics, uh, uh, understanding of genetics and genome and where that will take us in terms of breakthrough scientific work around um, immunotherapy and other things. So we're really on the cusp of some pretty, pretty cool stuff. So the last thing I thought I would spend a couple minutes on is just um, before I open it up is sort of what are some of my observations around the social sector? And I've alluded to these, but, um, but this is actually relevant whether you're a for-profit um, startup entrepreneur thinking about social impact or you're running a large NGO or you're a government and doing public policy or all of the above. And some of this comes out of, I, I'm on the Social Innovation Council at the World Economic Forum, and we've been doing some work on what are these larger themes that the world should be paying attention to. And I think it's relevant as well for the uh, early stage entrepreneur. Um, one is we have a very, very big shift in the geographic um, model we're working on. And it's happened just in the last 20, 25 years. And that's not only the shift I was just describing in terms of where the pockets of the deepest inequity and, and, and inequality are, 
um, not only poor countries, but how do we de address the pockets of great inequity in, uh, in Vietnam? I was just a poet, uh, the president was in Vietnam, uh, the US was in Vietnam today, and we just got a, 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 an email about him visiting the uh, emergency operations center that we've helped set up there around disease control. But, um, you know, but in Vietnam, it's about a middle-income country, but, but actually has enormous pockets of poverty. So how are we going to support their journey to enable um, those folks to have more potential? But also, where's the center of innovation? Um, so there's been a large presumption that innovation is sort of the product of the West or the North that we then send to the South. And of course, that was never right. But it's really changing now where innovation is the, the source of inno great innovation is coming from all over the world and we need to tap into it and you know, support it, sh um, you know, provide more um, support, both financial support and technical support for that. The second is I would say this increased multi-sector solutions. And when I say multi-sector, I, I mean both, uh, I primarily mean across public, private, and social sector, and including academic. Um, and, and we, you know, there is just so much good literature and evidence that, you know, we can't solve any of these big problems by any one sector alone. And, um, and one of the hardest things to do is figure out, like we did with the meningitis project, is how do you bring the right private sector players, the right public sector players, the right nonprofit sector players into a room and discuss how to actually change the, the way the, the world works. But you've got to find ways to work together. There tends to be still a fair amount of bias around, well, that can be only solved by the marketplace, or that can be solved by, you know, without government, or we can do that, you know, that's a government mandate. And the reality is, is there are times and places for all of those things, but ultimately we've got to see more multi-sector solutions. And, and I think there's, there's a, a sense of how we do that more than ever. I think that um, there's some new models. I think the social innovation curriculum here supports that. Um, I think scale and governments matter. And I say this particularly, I, I gotta tell you, in my classes at Stanford, the one big aha that every year the class reports back is like, wow, we just assumed that government was always our enemy in this stuff. You know, like our, we're kind of taught in most of our courses here to avoid regulators as long as you can. Um, and, 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 and it's like, well, if you're gonna get your innovation to scale, Good luck with that then, because, because unless you actually collaborate, I mean, most countries, particularly in health, government is, has the mandate for health. Um, not so much here, but, um, and so you can't actually reach people without working with government, working with regulators, and engaging them in the right way. And I think that um, scale, I think we're gonna see a big shift to say we, you know, pilots and small, projects that only reach five or 10,000 people and don't get to scale and are not, are trying to circumvent the governments are just not gonna be as um, successful. And we'll see uh, less of that appetite over the next decade. So, um, you know, social entrepreneurs beware, but you need to be doing your thing, but figuring out how to take them to scale and work with government to do that. And then the final thing is that I, I do think we sometimes confuse innovation and technology. And um, innovation comes in a lot of forms. It's not necessarily a product or a tool, and it's not necessarily digital. And so um, I, I would encourage you, as you think about your social entrepreneurial idea, to think about, okay, what part of this is the tool or the product or the system but what part, or the technology, but what part is also how do the incentives work? How does the information system work so I can understand better what I'm doing? How do we actually communicate to people? How do I change behavior so people will work differently? And, and that's equally important. So with that, I will, um, I think, wrap up and just open it to questions. But um, my final, you know, kind of perspective would be, uh, you know, there's just an amazing amount of opportunity um, to be part of this, uh, what I described the fourth arc in my life, but you know, you all could create a lot of other arcs in your own life, lives, but to be part of this global health and development arc, um, we've got a lot of things we need to get done. There's a lot of big threats facing the world, uh, whether it's pandemics or climate or instability, but it's gonna take the work of all of us to figure out how to how to come together and be very smart and creative to do that. And I'm really delighted there's a group at Stanford um, thinking about that. So thanks.
So I guess about 15 minutes of question and answer, and I'm supposed to repeat the question. So if I fail to repeat the question, tell me. Comments or questions? And I was told this was not a shy group. There we go. Uh, I know a good point to make here. Um, I know at least a handful of us here are law students, and I was wondering if you had any advice for students who want to get into transition from law to other areas so that they can get, you know, get a little bit of knowledge into them. Yeah. Well, I, I think so. Yeah. The question is about. Um, uh, there are law students in the room. I'm a recovering lawyer, and so uh, how did I get to, into that uh, process? Um, or what advice would I give? And I actually think it's true whether it's you know any discipline, whether it's law, or I think this is, I see this with the MBA students I teach, um, that we all get locked into kind of our 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 um, focus and our training, and then there's a lot of both real and often sort of perceived pressures around you know, and often you know things like debt get in the way too. You know, like oh my God, I got to pay back my loan, but but also um, things like okay, there seems to be it's so critical to get this right job and then the next right job, or there's this sort of map that gets created that you, people feel so wedded to, and and that's a hard thing to resist. And, and there's really logic behind some of that map um, that you can't uh, resist. But I would say, you know, the, first of all, law can be, particularly, can be an incredible instrument for social good. Um, and, you know, whether you're practicing law uh, in order, you know, and you don't have to be a civil rights lawyer to do that. I mean, practicing law in a way that you're bringing, I mean, everything we do, for instance, has a huge legal framework behind it. Sort of how do we negotiate all of this? How do we get the patents right? How do we manage the intellectual property? Who's, uh, who's, and, but, but even in a practice of law, you can find places, and I found that in my own life, to, um, to uh, put your energy, get on, you know, uh, boards where you start feeling, you know, kind of connecting to the community in ways that you're using your skills and your training and still keeping your day job. Um, and then, and then my, my instinct or decision was really built on at some fundamental level of like, you know, am I going to, how do I, how do I make, how do I think about impact, the kind of impact I think I want to make, and then how do I match that with personal satisfaction and happiness, me and my family, and how do, you know, and, and it's that sort of figuring out that intersection, impact and happiness, that I think um, often we fail to kind of uh, communicate well in academic settings or in business settings. And, and ultimately, I was just talking to a guy out at the, the cafe uh, who was a very brilliant guy out of my class next year. And, and you could so, you know, in the conversation, I played his conversation back to me and I said, it's so clear what you want, but you have another track going in your head is what everybody's been telling you you ought to do because you're at Stanford or because, and, and just really t listening to that and, and challenging that constantly will pay off in the end. There's a lot you can do as a practicing lawyer. There's a lot legal skills bring to the table, um, and, but I think sometimes it takes a leap of faith sometimes to get out of that rut. Other questions or comments? Yeah. You talk about the one injection contraceptive and that you want to put it out there as soon as possible, but there are a lot of <coughs> concerns that you're having this discussion on when to do it and how to do it. Would you mind telling us about how that process happens? What are the concerns and how do you plan that timeline? And how do you kind of balance the pros and cons of making it too early or too late? Sure. So the question for uh, is, as we talk about scaling innovation, and particularly as I mentioned, the injectable contraceptive, the the choice of how fast do you move, and the pros and cons of scale and speed, and and uh, wh when do you have to get enough evidence and um, to move faster? Um, it, it's a it's a great question and not an easy answer. In fact, the main answer was, well, take my class, right? Um, but um, uh, the, but the, the short answer is, um, it gets back to that sort of valley of death scenario, is within each of those sort of phases of the development and introduction cycle, um, we, there, there are a fair number of benchmarks that you need to be thoughtful about. Now, sometimes they're highly regulated. So in a, you know, in a um, vaccine development, 
the, uh, the vaccine regulatory authorities will tell you exactly when you can move things forward or not. And so sometimes it's very controlled. But in a lot of the stuff we do, it's, it's kind of us setting, uh, working with you know, authorities, but setting a little bit the pace and the plan ourselves because um, you know, some of this isn't highly regulated. Like um, that, that's somewhat regulated, but it's not super high. But the thing that we're, we care about is ultimate long-term sustainable impact. And so what we have done, what we see is sometimes it, you know, it sounds so cliche, but it actually speeds you up by, you know, slow down to speed up problem. And if we slow down enough to make sure that we've really followed sort of the correct steps and built, you know, tested it a few times, built enough evidence that we can go to policymakers and have a fairly clear view of what worked and what didn't work. Um, kill projects readily along the way so that we're not seen as a group that just romances an idea, but we have the discipline to take evidence and take action against the evidence. But then also recognizing that unintended consequences can be the worst thing that, you know, unexpected unintended consequences can be the worst thing that you can have in scaling innovation. That, you know, and, and some stuff you'll never know, right? I mean, who knew, you know, Zika six months ago maybe. But there's a lot of stuff we know that will come up and we've seen it happen before. So you go back, in this instance, we know that suddenly we're giving women who have basically in communities where there's been very little access to any kind of rights to health, a tool. You know, are they going to use it properly? Will they start, you know, will there be a gray market developed here or not? There turns out not to be one, but that was a question, you know. We've seen other commodities go into some of these communities where suddenly there were created, there was a, they would suddenly show up in the pharmaceutical, selling in, you know, the frontline pharmaceutical. Someone's, you know, is this, are there, are, um, are people well trained how to use it? Or are we going to see mistakes and accidents? So can we be spending some time observing so it will help us understand how to introduce it and how to train people and what kind of program needs to be delivered? So it was just a set of actually not highly complicated things, but we've observed through a lot of work over 40 years and through a lot of literature of what's gone wrong in other similar instances, and then taking that and developing a, design, a framework or a design that you kind of then check the boxes, right? So we've demonstrated this, 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 and this. And then when you finally do go to scale, you can, um, you can feel more confident that you're not going to get blindsided by something you ought to have thought about. Um, um, now, I asked to honestly, I mean, this one's where Bill and I have gone, you know, he and I disagree on. He wants to go this fast. And I'm like, no, we've got to go through the steps here. And we've got to sort of do the operational research to demonstrate, you know, it's yes, it means that, you know, I get it, that it means that some women who want it won't get it as fast. And that's, that's, you know, that's in this business, you face that every day. But if we do this the right way, more women will have access to it than we could even imagine in a year. And so let's just sort of take our time to get, do, get that right. Any other questions? Yeah, what are the differences between helping people living in primarily poor countries and the poor living in middle income countries? How does this work out? Yeah, it's a... <laughs> There will be a lot of work on that in the next uh, decade because it's, it's, it's um, kind of glaring, it's this glaring challenge we have. So the difference is that the world of global health and development, there's a lot of levels of difference, but let me put a couple of meta pieces here, um, has been really framed up around how does the rich world help the poor world. Um, and, and, and I'm talking about global development. I'm not talking about, you know, the work of social impact broadly, which is often, you know, in one's community, one's backyard. But now I'm talking about kind of the post-World War II global development framework where you started seeing aid and development, et cetera, take place. And it was, and it was targeted on, and we came up with all sorts of bad, you know, frameworks, the North and the South, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and what that meant is, so the main mechanism, the main way to measure that was a GDP per capita at a national level. So basically, the poor, uh, the, 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 the norms of aid were built around country, the poorest countries, and that was measured in a national level GDP per capita. So 
um, which worked for quite a while uh, to the degree it worked at all. I mean, in the sense of if you believe aid, some people don't think aid worked. I think you can't. It clearly has worked in terms of pulling people out of poverty and helping it and another of other levels, but and, and certainly saving lives. Whether it's been as transformative as some people, that's another issue. But um, but the problem is is now in the last ten or fifteen years, that GDP per capita list means that there are a number of countries that are graduating from aid. Um, and over the next decade, if the trends continue, and they almost certainly will, will graduate from aid, they will go beyond the GDP per capita. Um, and so suddenly, people like the US Congress or um, the British government start saying, or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I mean, the big funders of traditional aid programs start saying, you know, I don't have any political, particularly the government people, I don't have any political um, uh, 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 validation or even, you know, um, accountability to give money to uh, a middle-income country. So suddenly places like India and Vietnam and um, Ethiopia will eventually um, very quickly be um, a middle-income country. So that's actually all good. That's all a good news story in the general sense that, you know, we are seeing success. We're seeing more economic and better health and economic indicators. But what happens is actually the pockets of the, the, the GDP per capita is a, just a bad number because it doesn't reflect um, a few things. It doesn't reflect subnational differences where there can be immense poverty like in Bihar in northern India versus southern India. Or it doesn't reflect um, that um, some places the wealth is all concentrated in the hands of so few people that the GDP may be up, but it's all being, you know, in Nigeria is it a good example, where you see this enormous amount of wealth being created in the south with the oil companies. So the GDP per capita in Nigeria has gone, is up pretty high, but, you know, it doesn't in anything account for poverty in the north. And so what, you know, so we've got to, A, come up with a different model for deciding who gets aid and when and how. But then it also means we have to move to more of a subnational view of the world. So it isn't about, you know, going, it isn't about aiding some poor country. It's about helping support a region or a subregion to kind of what their needs and development opportunities are. And then it also means that um, the role of the private sector starts changing in this dynamic. So places like um, Vietnam right now, we actually do a lot of work in Vietnam. Um, it's actually a middle-income country, a very, you know, but, but what we see is um, uh, a number of companies who are now investing in Vietnam are recognizing that whether it's their, part of their license to operate or because of their genuine concern for bringing up you know, communities that need it, access to drugs and, and, and tools, they're willing to help support that effort to get, you know, to be part of that marketplace as well as to be um, a respected player in the country. So you actually see um, the role of the private sector being affected too. But it's a whole books on it, so we'll eventually figure it out. I think I'm reaching the end. Thank you guys. <laughs>